Hello, today on Online for Authors, I'm chatting with Kirsten Weiss, author of Legacy of the Witch. Welcome, Kirsten. Hi, it's nice to be here. It is so wonderful to have you. I enjoyed the book. Before we really get into it, though, why don't you give listeners like a really quick elevator pitch? What are they going to find when they open up the, the cover of the book? They're going to find a mystery. They are going to find... Um, a submersion in Pennsylvania Dutch country, which I think is a lot of fun and, and spooky and beautiful, uh, especially in the woods around them. And um, they're going to find a little bit extra, too, because of my mystery school. Yes. So that's like that's something I'd really want to talk with you about. Um, this is a, like a cozy mystery. Right? Would yes. you put it yeah, in? The this, yeah. Right. All the blood is off the page. The body right. is found and it's not too horrible. Right, right. And, um, but it's got like a paranormal twist. So what made you delve into this idea of, of, you know, the mystery school, the, the witch, the, like, what put you to that point with your cozy mysteries? Well, I have another witch mystery series called the Witches of Doyle. Okay. And I really felt like that series had pretty much come to the end. But when I ended it in the final book, the witches decide to create a mystery school to bring in more talented witches to help, you know, so they right. can do good things in the world. So it's, it's basically a spinoff of that. And as to mystery schools, um, I can't remember how I first stumbled across the mystery school, the Golden Dawn, uh, which is a, a Victorian era mystery school that started, started in London. And I just got fascinated by it. They were teaching each other magic. They were working with tarot cards as part of their training. And the thing about the Golden Dawn is it broke up in the early 20th century. And so all of their secrets were leaked. <laughs> so it was, no longer, it was no longer such a mystery. So you can read those big, thick books about their rituals and the stuff they did. And all these other things, schools spun off of it. Like there's another mystery school that started in America called Builders of the Adidam which I think it started around, I'm going to say 1910, but fact check me on that. Okay. <laughs> um, and it started out as a mail order mystery school because people couldn't gather. It's it's really hard to get from, you know, like the, the plains of Oklahoma to you know, Nebraska in a day for your meeting. So it was all mail order. And again, they used tarot cards as part of the training. They would send out these little black and white cards and you would paint them and color them in and, and meditate on the lesson of a tarot card. So when I was, anyway, so I got very, I just, I had Mr. Schools on the brain. I actually joined Builders of the Adidam for a time just to get all the little <laughs> information and cards. Right. And um, I realized that, I, I wondered why in the age of the internet, they hadn't moved the internet. I, I don't think they have yet. I think it's still all mail order. But I thought, huh, a internet mystery school, that has some potential <laughs> yeah. for a book. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's part of the book is that you've created a mystery school where people can go and get the tarot cards and things that are talked about within the pages of the book. Yeah. So the the heroine of the book signs up for the mystery school. She doesn't really believe in it. Right. And she's these these weird cards start appearing and she starts getting these email messages for the mystery school and they all conveniently happened to align with the challenges she's going through right. to help her right. get through them. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I went a little off the rails with the, my untarot deck. I call it, it's not a tarot deck. And I made an app for it, which if you buy the book, you can get the app for free. You can sign up for the mystery school emails so you can get the emails every week. And then I just published the physical deck. I just got it this week and I started shipping it out. So I've got yeah. this lovely purple pouch for it. Ooh, how fun. I've got the cards. Oh, cool. And so, so why is it called untarot instead of tarot? Okay. So a tarot deck has a very specific structure. There are okay. four, um, what they call pips or like the, the suits, you, suits that you see in a playing card deck. Okay. Except the, the, instead of hearts, they're cups and instead of diamonds they're coins. And then there's a fifth suit called the Major Arcana or the Trump suit. And that has 22 cards, zero through 21, the fool through the world. And it's, it's just, it's very specific. And okay. I wanted to take the essentials of a tarot deck, um, the meanings that go back to Neoplatonism, the ancient Greeks, and work it into a modern deck 
And you know, what, is, what do these things mean for us today? Because I still think there is, there's so much wisdom in the ancient Greeks. It's weird. You, I was reading, I think it was some Marcus Aurelius or one of the other Stoic philosophers and the stuff he was going through. And oh my gosh, it's the same stuff we go through today, the backbiting, oh, yeah. the silliness, yeah. the frustrations. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's humans have not changed that much in 2000 no. years. No. <laughs> and the Greeks really sat down and thought about what makes a good life. How do we live a good life? How do we connect with the eternal? And um, and then the, the, during the Renaissance, they took those messages and put them into tarot cards. So I thought, why don't I create my own deck? I'm, I'm not going to do a tarot deck because tarot, there's so many beautiful tarot decks out there. And I just feel like I could add to it. But I thought I could kind of pare it down and get the essential messages from yeah. the tarot deck, put it into something smaller, and then use images that were a little more relatable to the modern woman. It is yeah. a very feminine deck because my mystery school is all all women. All women um, right. And I, it, originally I was just doing it for the books, but I, I didn't plan on creating the whole deck. I was just, oh, I'll create you know, a card here and there for the book where it makes sense. And then I, I just, I don't know, madness took over if I got channeled <laughs> or something, but <laughs> suddenly I had 54 cards. <laughs> And then when I went to publish the deck, finally, they were like, well, you can do 56. I'm like, okay, two more cards. I know exactly more, what I'm going to do. <laughs> so I went crazy. Cool. Yeah, no, I love that idea too, especially when you were talking about that, that, you know, humans haven't changed that much. I write a lot of historical fiction and the number of times I've heard people say, oh, but this is so pertinent to today. And it's like, well, of course it is. Yeah. Of course it so is. Because the truth is, 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 Families still fight, you know, people still don't like change. There's still backbiting. There's still people who, who push others to the bottom, trying to get to the top. There's still all of those things. And, and even things like racism, it, it may have changed which race we're isming at the moment, but the, the concept has been there oh, yeah. forever, you know, and yeah. it, it it might change its flavor, but it doesn't actually change much of anything, you know? So I, I like that idea that you called it the untero deck and essentially are using the wisdom from the past. So, yeah. Very yeah. And there's a lot of wisdom there. It's, it, it's oh, been yeah. a fascinating journey. I've learned so much about ancient Greek philosophy and, <laughs> and allegories and, it's been a lot of fun and it's it's really helped me, especially um book two in the series, Shadow of the Witch, which comes after Legacy of the Witch. Yeah. Uh, but can, they but just I have to say, uh you can read them in any order <laughs> because okay. they're different okay. heroines for each book. <laughs> um that one, um, I was going through something and I just kind of used it to work it out and it was very, very helpful for me and I learned so much. So yeah. It's, yeah. It's, so and, I and I wrote a fun story. Yeah, and I think that's what's really fun about the as I was reading the book. If you just want a good story, that's what you're looking for. You're just wanting a good cozy mystery. You're going to enjoy it. You don't even have to go look up the cards. Like like you put things right on the page for anyone who doesn't wish to go any further than that. It is just a good, solid, fun cozy mystery. And to me it had a lot of wisdom. And so if you wanted more, you know, if you like me, I love to read and find some tidbits of things. There was that, too. And there were a lot of things that that as I was reading, I thought, huh, I should probably put that on my wall and work on that for the next week. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that might be good for me, you know. And so I thought that was really very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I wanted the story to come first. I want people just to be able to read it and be like, this is fun. Yeah, there's, right. there's some romance, there's some danger, there's some magic. It's, it's all cool. Um, but I do, th again, when I really started digging into it, if you look at like the hero's journey, which is the backbone of so many classic story structures, right. which was brought up by Joseph Campbell, it really is a story of inner transformation alongside the, the you know, whatever crazy journey you're on, like Luke right. Skywalker He's you know, this naive boy on this desert planet, and then he's growing into a man, and he's starting to take these more seriously, and he's not goofing up so much, and he's you know dealing with relationships. And it's, I think the reason the hero's journey resonates for people so deeply is because this is humans. This is how we do things. We, we start this out is with all this, of us. Yeah. Yes. 
there are things we don't know. We're in this static state. Everything you think it's going along or maybe it's not going along so well. And then something happens to shake it up. And then you're like, well, I have to change, but I'm not going to because I like the way I am. And change is difficult. And there's that resistance to the call. And then, you know, the more you resist, the worse the worst like, things get because like, you life has changed and you have to change with it or you have to step up and it's that whole it is a hero's journey we are all the heroes of our own stories yeah so i i've gotten much more interested lately in kind of using that to go deeper again for people who want to because right. realistically you know we watch these stories and we don't know there's a hero's this hero's journey classic structure behind it it's just a good story right. we don't know why we like it it's it just we like it, and that's totally fine. <laughs> but yeah, I think and, if you and like I said, more, and if yeah. you're wanting more, there's definitely more there to find. Yeah, you know. So one of the things that that you say that people can find essentially is that you know same same issues are happening over and over with people. What else are you hoping that people might find it as they're reading? If they're looking for more than just the story, what are you hoping they come out of it with? I hope they come out of it with some tools for personal transformation. It's, this is something which I realize has kind of been a, a theme in my life. Maybe it's a theme in everybody's life. <laughs> transformation. I'm not special. <laughs> but, but I've gone through a lot of transformations and they're very challenging. And now I'm in my mid fifties and I'm going through the whole change, which is yeah. another, it's a physical transformation. Yeah. It's also an emotional transformation. Yes. And that was really kind of, yeah. It, it, you know it's going to happen to you, but it's always, a, I think it's probably always a surprise. Like, ah, <laughs> what's going on? Right. Um, and so I think we always, there are, there are threshold periods in all of our lives. There's doors that open and we have to decide, are we going to step through it or are we going to resist it and possibly make things a little bit worse or just right. keep, keep stumbling along as we are. And I hope for people who may about to be hitting one of those threshold moments, whatever it may be. Um, this will give us some inspiration and some hope and some ideas for how to move through that with grace and joy and success. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you really touched on the idea of the, the hero's journey and that I think the reason is it really resonates with people because it makes the character real. You know, when you see a character struggling with something that you can then identify with, and we can all identify with these human struggles, whether we've had that specific one or not, we understand those emotions that, that come with, with change and with, with dealing with people that we don't know what to do with or with, with situations that seem out of our control all of a sudden. And so you do, you just kind of like, like attach yourself to these characters and, and you're rooting for them. And that's why the story is good is because we we feel it somewhere deep in our soul. And so, you know, giving people tools to, to help themselves go through these same things. I mean, it's like, it's just like a little gift inside of a book. I hope so. That's what I want it to be. And I plan, I've written like the two in the series so far. I, I, I'm planning five or seven. I'm not sure which um, to go through all the Antero cards yeah. And long, long different themes. And um, I, I hope, yeah, I, I kind of took a little bit of inspiration from like Paulo Coelho. And I don't know if you've read the Celestine Prophecy. No. Although I don't, I didn't, I didn't, I confess, I don't care for the Celestine Prophecy as a story. I think this, the, but <laughs> the message is great. Right. But I wanted it to be more like story focused. Like, again, you can just read the story, enjoy the story. It's a good mystery. I've written lots of mysteries. I know how to do it. And, you know, again, it's just mystery, romance, magic, fun. And take that. And then, again, people, like you said, people who want to go deeper, who if Have they that want option. to, they can. If they don't yes. want to, put the book down. Good story. Bye. <laughs> right. Right. I, I just I, I really liked that about it. Um, I was a little not sure what I was going to think because I, I'm, I don't do tarot cards and, and witches and things. I mean, I'm not, I, it's just not who I am or where I, I am. And I thought like, how am I going to feel about this? Is it going to feel overwhelmingly odd for me? And it wasn't, 
And I think that's the thing that I found really great was you introduced me to a world that I'm not super comfortable in, but in a way that I walked away comfortable. I didn't ever feel like I was being uh, challenged for my personal beliefs or anything like that. Do you know what I'm saying? It just felt yeah. very natural. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not trying to jam my philosophies down yeah. people's throats. I know yeah. like magic and the esoteric is weird. It's intentionally weird. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> legend, me, Legacy of the Witch I based that magic off a Pennsylvania Dutch form of folk magic called, I'm going to mispronounce it, Brokerai. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It comes from, it you know, came over from Germany and right. it, it's a mashup of like Christian mysticism and folk magic. And it is still being practiced in Pennsylvania today. There are a lot of myths about it, which are not correct. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually, so I'm, my father was from Pennsylvania, Dutch country. I, I found out his uncle was a broker. He, he, he did that folk magic. I, I wish, yeah. I wish I'd learned more when everybody was alive to tell me more about it. So my dad right. told me a few stories when I was just a kid. And I was like, well, that's dumb. <laughs> right, know? right, right. Because right. as, kid, as kids, we just don't listen to stuff like that. I know. Yeah. I know. And yeah. then when we want to listen, it's too late. So yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the storytellers are gone. <laughs> right. Um, so whenever I go back to Penn Dutch country to visit the, the relatives, I try to do a little bit of research and, and there, there are some great research books out there. There's a professor at uh, one of the colleges who's written some great stuff on Brokerai and hex signs and all of it. So I, I leaned on his research quite heavily for the book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's fun. I mean, it's, it's also kind of, yeah, a book should take you to another place. Yes. Not, not necessarily physically another place. It could just be like another world. It could be another way of being, another time. Not, uh, just another way of looking at things even. Yeah. Yeah. So I really did try to make this legacy of the witch a little bit feel like, okay, I'm taking a journey into Penn Dutch country. I'm on vacation. <laughs> right. I I'm think, escaping. I think, I think the other thing that really helped me is, is that the main character was not like immediately a believer of all of this like she was fighting against it so it didn't it didn't ever feel like it was wrong for me to wonder and be uncomfortable and and think like well what is all of this and and what do I believe it it never felt absurd that I was not like immediately involved in in tarot type cards because neither was the main character and yeah. so it felt okay to go on the journey with her so yeah. you did a really good job with that oh, instead you. of no, because you could have, you could have done it where she was like fully immersed in it from the beginning. And then it would have been hard for someone to come in and challenge any of their own belief systems because they would have felt immediately, I don't know, maybe like pressured and it didn't mm -hmm. feel that way at all. Instead, it felt like, okay, well, let's go on this journey and see what she learned. It was, it was great. I liked it. <clears throat> Sorry. That's I don't right. know what's in my throat. Um, but I also think when it comes to magic and the paranormal, it's very healthy to retain some skepticism. <laughs> I mean, not every bump in the night is a ghost. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and there are a lot of charlatans out there. And there are a lot of people who, who deeply believe, but they're maybe a little delusional, <laughs> let's just say. But I do think, I, I personally think there is something else out there. I... Um, I, I don't think we're meant to know, understand everything that's going on around us. Um, and I think the mystery of that is also quite a bit of fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you do an incredible amount of research, obviously, to, to pull this kind of thing off, which I find fascinating because with most cozy mystery authors that I chat with, there's a little bit of research maybe around the area that they're going to be writing in so that they get that right. But you really are, I mean, you've so far brought up like some major philosophical players and, and things. So you do a lot of research. Is that something you enjoy? Is that like just part of you, the research oh, very, aspect? Very much so. I, I love that stuff. I love reading about, yeah, it's my, I, sorry, I have to buy this book. <laughs> Yeah, this professor, uh, the brown variety. It's it's business. I need yes. this. I can use and it as I, a tax write off. <laughs> exactly. I'm eagerly reading it and using this stuff in my books. I love that. I love talking to people who 
are practicing witches or astrologers, or even like a friend of mine works in a tea room and I have this, I have a tea room series of mysteries that I was planning. And so immediately I grabbed her. I'm like, I want the schedule. What time is it open? What are you right. doing before it opens? Yeah. Yeah. How do you close up? You know, how you, and so I wanted it all because I wanted it to be realistic Real. and without, yeah. I didn't, I mean, I don't, I try not to bog the reader down in the details, but when I say our second seating is at you know, two o'clock, like, okay, I, I know what that means. Yes. The, the, team, the team yeah. room people know what that means. And it's like, okay, the reader needs to say, okay, second seating at two o'clock. That, that's fine. We know it's two o'clock now and they're having a second seating, but they don't need to know like all the details. Of, okay, there's going to be five seatings. Right. So it's just, um, I, I just think it, it makes it all more real and it makes it more real for the reader. If you can drop, if you could be as accurate as possible with some of this stuff. Yeah, I, I love the aspect of research where, I mean, you always do way more than you put in a book. Sure. You, you, you know, way more things, but you find those tidbits that help create a reality that as your readers reading it, they stay firmly wherever it is you want them to be. You know, in a tea room, in the Ukraine, wherever it is that you've done enough research and, and drop enough pieces that they are there and they stay there while they're reading. Yeah, I, I think it's fun for a lot of readers too to, to get these little fun facts yeah. like, oh, now now I know about this weird Pennsylvania Dutch folk magic. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And no, the hex signs and, aren't yeah. magic. And no, yeah, all about, of the yeah, things. Like, no, I, th I thought it was, like I said, I thought it was very interesting. Um, are you a plotter or are you a pantser? I'm, I'm kind of in between. I will okay. plot, I'll usually plot out like the first third or half of the book and then the very ending of the book. And then I'll kind of see where it takes me in the middle okay. because I, I, I honestly, I, I know people who are plotters and I, I just admire it so much. They just have this clear vision of like yeah. every step the hero or the detective is going to take. I'm like, I don't, I don't know because I'm still getting to know the hero. It's like, I, I, I think I'm like, okay, this, this is what, the type of person this person is, but it takes me having to write it out before I really understand who that character is and what she might do next. Right. So, so you do write the end. Have you ever had to rewrite your end? Because what's been going along now that end that you thought was going to be it isn't it anymore? Yeah, I've, I, there was one time where I had to change who the murderer was. Yep. I was about halfway through and I just thought, this makes no sense for this person to be the killer. It has to be this other person. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, it didn't change the ending so much. I mean, it changed the revelation of who the killer was, but the actual, you know, what happens in the ending, the right. exciting finale was still, the structure was there. It was just who did, who done it and why who, who it was done it changed. Yeah. 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 No, so I, I like that even though you have some, some plotter, moments you allow the pantser part that just says you know i'm discovering as i go and sometimes things change um i've had many moments where i'm 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 very much a pantser i am so pantser that like i don't even i tried plotting i'm stuck on a book right now because i tried plotting and i can't go anywhere i, I backed myself into such a, a a hole that i'm gonna have to go and get rid of so much that i wrote because it just doesn't make any sense to me anymore because I tried to do this whole plotty thing that is just not for me. Um, but I mean, I have characters that, that refuse to participate. I'll say, okay, this is where we're going. And they're like, no, we're not going there. Yeah. <laughs> That's happened to me too. You're going to have a dearth of thought now because I absolutely refuse to be part of that whole thing. Because if you think that's what I would do, then you don't know me. And I'm going to stand over here in the corner until you're ready to play correctly. And it's like, Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think maybe it's because I'm an introvert, but I have a challenge getting to know people quickly. I, mm -hmm. It takes me time. And it's the same is true with my characters. And I know exactly how ridiculous that sounds. Like, it's my character. I'm inventing this character. Mm -hmm. But still, <laughs> it's just my brain doesn't work that way. No. And I think, you know, I'll tell people all the time that I get these thoughts and it's like, I don't even know where they come from. I mean, I know intellectually they're obviously mine. You know, and they, they're coming from some place in my brain that I don't have easy access to all the time. But when it comes bubbling up, it feels as though the character is telling me things. And I know it's me. And it's really hard to explain to someone who hasn't experienced it because they look at you like, mm, medicine, you probably need medicine. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but yeah, there's that. 
I don't know. And, and it is getting to know the character. And, and the more you write them, the more you recognize that maybe something that you had considered really wouldn't fit their personality at all. Exactly. Like, you know, I, I thought they would go this way, but oh, that wouldn't, I mean, now that I know them, there's no way they would do that. So what would they do instead? You know, and you have to kind of like work around all of those issues. So in this series or in this, this book, not the series, in this book, do you have a favorite character? Well, I've been bringing back characters from my Doyle Witch series uh -huh. uh, because they're the ones who started the mystery school and, and also for my Rika Hayworth series because she got involved in that as well at the end. Um, so yes, I, I do crossovers. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think so Rika Hayworth shows up in Shadow of the Witch, which is book two. And I, she's very close to my heart because she's the first but the metaphysical detective is the first book I published. And that was a okay. Rika Hayward story. And so she's kind of my first character or, you know, hero. Um, so I have a sneaky affection for her, but I mean, I like, I like all, if I didn't like them, I wouldn't write them because well, I, yeah, you know, yeah. The, 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 I do write dislikable characters who are intentionally dislikable because I don't like them, <laughs> but I want the reader to enjoy the characters too. And um, so, yeah, I, I like them all the heroes yeah. at least yeah I, I i feel the same way with mine it's it's kind of like i mean sometimes i feel a little closer to one than another like maybe there's more of me in that character or me the way i wish i was mm -hmm. you know um, i i tell people that you know i've been asked like you know are you in any of your characters and it's like i'm pretty much in all of my characters at least to some degree and it's as i was as i am as i hope to be you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or I mean, as I hope to never be, maybe even some of those characters, you know, like, or or you take, I have a character in my my latest book that, um, she has a real time with change. She just, well, so do I, and so I took it further than me, mm -hmm. you know, and she's hard to like because she really is like stuck in doing things one way and one way only. And it was a good look at what can happen to your own self. Like if you don't allow yourself to change and if you don't allow yourself to be open to possibilities and, you know, all the things that, that I find difficult at times because I like my world to be neat and tidy and, you know, life is not neat nor tidy. And, and sometimes I find myself really railing against that. And so it was fun to write a character who really railed against it and then see where that letter. That is, um, I have to say, that's actually a big theme in tarot. Oh, uh, is it? Part of the, yeah, part of the tarot journey. And the lesson is if you, you know, change happens, it's, it's inevitable. Yeah. Yes. And if you can go with it, you can, you can move it to a nicer place. And if you resist it, then things are going to go bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then you, and then you end up fighting, you know, what did they call it? Kicking against the pricks. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's very much. And, and I see myself go that way at times. And then I have to, to like stop and take the deep breath and remember. Um, I tell everyone that, that the way I do change is I have a five minute meltdown, fall completely apart, you know, rail against all that is happening to me. Then I take a deep breath and say, okay, what do we need to do? Yeah. You know, that seems very healthy. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't be, um, yeah, I can't be like really logical and think things through and make it to the next place without getting all that emotional junk out. And so I just go ahead. I'm, I'm a big crier. I can cry. Well, I cry when I'm happy. I cry when I'm angry. I cry when I'm sad. I just, I, so, you know, the number of times that I'll just, oh, I just feel life. and then it's like, all right, let's pull up our pants. What are we going to do now? Yeah. yeah, shake it off. Yeah, yeah. Kind well, honestly, I, I don't know anybody who enjoys a change that they did not themselves initiate. It's. I guess that's true. Some when, people, some people handle it outwardly better. I think some people have more of that yeah. ability to look like they're fine. Yeah. You know, and I've I've never mastered that part. That's the whole thing of like letting go of the vision. It's, it's all about letting go. It's like yeah. we have this vision of the world, or the way the world our world should be and our life should be. And sometimes you have to just let go of that. Let go of that because it's and just until not, you let go of it, you can't move on. 
Yeah, exactly. So what's next for you, Kirsten? Uh, I am currently working on another T and Tarot novel, which I told everybody is coming out at the end of February. So I really need to knuckle down <laughs> on it because I'm a little bit late right now. Um, and then after I get that done, I am going to turn back to my mystery school series. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. So, hey, guys, if you want to keep this conversation going, head on over to Novels and Latte Book Club. There you're going to have the opportunity to win a free copy, a free digital copy of Kirsten's book, Legacy of the Witch. So definitely head on over to Novels and Latte. Um, Kirsten, if someone wanted to reach out to you and talk with you about your writing or about um, your book, books in general or about the Ontario deck or anything along that line, how do they reach you? Um, I've got a contact page uh, at my website, kirstenweiss.com. And um, yeah, they'll probably be the best way. Super. And I'll have that those links in the show notes. So as well as like you, you're on social media as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. on Facebook, Kirsten yeah. Weiss author, Instagram. I think that's that's what, I'll have the links right. below. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I'll have okay. those links. So that's great. So Kirsten, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. It was fantastic. Listeners, run right out. Grab the book. You're going to love it. And then once you're done loving it, make sure you review it because reviews are something that authors live for. <laughs> so thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for listening to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character-driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch. Tune in next Tuesday for another podcast episode.